Good afternoon. It's great to connect with you. It is a privilege. I don't take these privileges lightly. Each day that I live, I know that it is because of the mercy of the Lord while I'm here, or why I'm here, why am I, I am alive. And, um, you know, we just have to be grateful for his goodness towards us. It's not as bright or as brilliant as it has been uh, the days before, but it's still a wonderful day. We've never had a day like this, where we could always say we've had similar days, but we've never experienced a Tuesday afternoon such as this. Minutes after two here in the afternoon, the Lord is good. And there is so much that can be said. There is so much to be done. We can't say everything. And we certainly can't do everything, but we just have to do what we can while we live in the presence of the Lord. I want to move swiftly um, as we are embarking, I believe, on a very, very important part in Scripture. Why is this important? Well, I believe it's the Word of God. The um, Joel, again, is no important than any other book. You know, I believe that every book that I have and that we have gone through together, and that I know that there were a few who have followed me, you're listening to me. <laughs> I don't know how many uh, minutes you listen to. Uh, face, Facebook doesn't, doesn't allow me at times to know. And even if they do put the average amount of minutes that people listen to. I don't know if they're doctoring it. I don't know if it's true. I can't say it's false. I have no um, details or I don't have anything to prove anything that, that I can say or what they are not saying. But I do believe that those of you who have followed me, who have listened to what I have to say, should at least get at least a little inclination that the prophets, the prophetic books that we have looked at, each one that we have looked at together, we can see and we can say that they're important. The prophets had their different characters in which they had to deal with. They ministered at different times, not all at the same time. But the message that was that they gave or that was given to them to give to the people more or less is the same. They are very similar in nature, very similar in that um, there was a call for repentance. There was a call to repent, to turn away from sin. In as much as all of that, there was there was also all, also a call that uh, that more or less um, indicated to them that they must examine themselves, that they have to examine their lives, to repent of their sins, the danger that was to come, the the captivity, the because God used nations. He used nations to chastise his people. In as much as he used nations, he also used nature, not only to, um, not only against his people to some extent, but to, to, but, to, but to paint a picture of the nations that were to come and what they would do. For instance, for, for an example, in the case of in the case of Joel, what we're doing here, the locusts, they were to come. They were to devastate the vegetation. I keep repeating that, but, you know, I think we've got to understand, in my mind, let me say, <laughs> and I could have it wrong. And if I've got it wrong, please, please let me know. Even if it's in a little text message to say, you've got it wrong. You're void of understanding. Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm here to help you. As some of my friends would say, I'm here to school you. So if you want to school me, that's fine. Um, 
But the, the, the locust came and devastated the land of Israel, of Judah, completely allowed the economy to go belly up, so to speak. But not only did that happen to um, physically to the people, but it was also a picture that was to be painted that the nations from the north, and let us say, pro, let us say it was the Assyrians, I, I believe at this time. It could have been the Assyrians or it could have been the Babylonians. But, the, but this nation, this world power at that time was to come and to come and completely destroy, if not devastate, uh, the nation of Israel. But it was not to annihilate Israel because God would not have allowed that anyway. But in, in, in the lives of the prophets, that was the picture that was painted. But, but at the end of that, God always brought about a blessing. There was always a blessing that would come after. There was always a blessing that would come after uh, the, just, the, the chastisement or the chastising of, of the people. So they were, they, there was something that they could look forward to. So each of the prophets, I think that we could, we can um, get that from the scriptures. And that's why I think that for us today, the scriptures are not only talking of, or do not only give historical facts or historical data, because we can always build a very good historical picture of what took place during the time of Israel during the time of the kings of the prophets well of the prophets and the, the judges the kings all the way through to malachi and um even even in the gospels you could say it's historical also because um let us say the day of pentecost happened way back in the eight in the early 80s <laughs> okay in the early um, in the in the early first century, so so we can always you know immerse ourselves in these things. We could always bring out some facts. We could always bring out the years, you know, the months of when certain things happen. And it's good for us to know these things. It's good for us to be able to identify with these things because they're they're very much a part of our history. We don't know where we're coming from. It is said we don't know where we're going. And so I believe that, you know, it's, it's good when we can look into the scriptures, when we can pull out the facts and the figures and make sense of it all. But I don't think that the Bible is only there for that. The Bible also is there to show us the future. It's there to tell us the future. And, the, and in the telling of the future, it then helps us to prepare ourselves for the future. So what in, and in particular, because we're doing Joel, we can also say that whatever, whatever is told us of what um, was to happen and is and did happen in the time of Israel. It's also telling us of what's going to happen on the day of the Lord. It is a it is a theme, it is a word, it is a sentence that is not new. I'm just getting a little pain in my shoulders here. I don't know where it's coming from. From my neck all the way down anyway. Um yes the day of the Lord the terror of the day of the Lord the terrible day of the Lord. However, however it comes through on the scriptures, it's telling us of that day. Telling us of the time that is to happen, that will take place. And because it's telling us of a time, of a day, of a point in, in time when these things are going to happen, then it, it it gives us time to prepare. Yes, it does. We don't have an excuse. I certainly don't have an excuse. 
And in the past couple of days or recent days, really, I've been very unsettled in myself, very, not very, um, not comfortable in myself. And I've been really thinking and because I want, I want to be prepared for the coming of the Lord, you know, whether it is through the portal of death, uh, whether, you know, I leave, leave this temporal plane through death um, or the Lord comes back and I see him for, for me, <laughs> see him come. Either way, what whatever happens, whatever takes place, my friend, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. And I want you to be ready. Because what's happening today, whether it be financial, in the financial world, whether it be in the political world, whether it be in the world of, of um, science, in the world of engineering, whether it be in the world of medicine. Um, and I know that the, all of these, all of those topics I mentioned are, are wide, very wide. But whatever is happening in those areas and in other areas, it's never happened before, even though the Bible says but there's nothing new under the sun. But whatever is happening has never happened, let's say, in our lifetime. It's new to us. And things are, are gathering pace increasingly. Incre in the last, let us say, in the last 20 years, previously, it took hundreds of years to get to where, they, to where we got to. But it would just seem that in the last 30 years, 40 years, technology has just taken off just like that. Just the knowledge of men, you know, what, whatever men have, have thought of and whatever men are doing, it's just mind boggling. And I dare say, I dare say that that there are other technologies that we're not hearing about. There are other things that's taking place that we are, that we don't know <laughs> is happening. They're testing. We're, we're oblivious to these things <clears throat> because we know that things come out usually by way of, of military, military aid, isn't it? So things are being tested on the military, in the war, even in Ukraine right now. I'm sure there are there are technologies being tested out on the field that if it is successful in the next five, 10, 15 years if the law tires, it may not even take that long anyway, but we will then begin to know about. But I'm troubled. I'm troubled in my in, in, in my spirit. I'm troubled because I want to make it and I want to um uh, be able to convey the message that the Lord is coming soon. I want it to be far and wide. I want it to get into certain places. I want it to trouble people also. Trouble people to the extent that they would call me and, and tell me, why am I troubling them? That's what the prophet... It, it happened with one of the kings, isn't it? Um, one of the prophets were prophesying and they were telling they were telling the king of what was uh, of their plans and they weren't even in the room um and even if you fast forward up to john the baptist with with herod i mean herod he he loved john but he feared john and john troubled him troubled him to the extent that that the woman that Herod had, which was not his, but his brother's, <laughs> um, got him killed, you know. So what we are doing, what what we really are involved in, you know, it's, um, it's a work that is rewarding, 
the Lord will reward us, but it's a dangerous one in as much as we are we are a combat in a world that is filled with evil, filled with unrighteousness. And everything that is being planned, everything that is being done in this world today, it's it's really being planned um, against God's people. It's really being planned to destroy God's people. It's really planned against you. Now, you may think you're insignificant. You may believe that you're in, insignificant, but you're really not. You are important wherever you are, whomever you stand before, uh, whichever city you minister in, you are a threat um, to the plans and to the advancement of the enemy. And so the message that you, the message that we have to give is should be there really to make people feel comfortable, but it is to trouble, it is to trouble um, societies to, to, to trouble the community in which we serve. And I think, and I really believe, you know, that the message that God gave each of his prophets, I don't think they were happy to give it. I mean, um, we know one and two, they were afraid of the people, or one and two, um, you know, but, but God encouraged them God encouraged them to stand that he would make, at least I think it was Jeremiah's face as flint, isn't it? So we shouldn't be afraid at all. You know, the message that we have to give at times, it's a troubling message because we don't know how the people are going to receive it. Or we know that the people are going to rail against us, really come up in our faces. And I believe that many of our um, previous generations, our fathers and mothers in ministry and years before that, I believe that they didn't have it as easy either. Uh, I'm sure they had it just as hard, just as difficult in delivering what God had placed on them because they were troubled because they themselves would see the impending danger. When <clears throat> When the watchman, if we take, for instance, the, the scriptures of the watchman and the wall, and we should blow the trumpet, as, as Joel says, it wasn't that they must blow the trumpet to have a party on the wall because the enemy is coming. <laughs> you know, one doesn't blow the trumpet to sound an alarm to have a party. This to know that the you know it's not a joyous time, it's not a joyous occasion. Knowing that the enemy is coming, the enemy is coming not to join the party. The enemy is coming to to take away our liberties, to take away our our freedom. They will they come to destroy, to pull down the walls that surround us or surround the city to destroy everything that is within the city that is causing the city to thrive. And in other words, what they have, they're then going to put in place what they want, all the programs, all the systems. It's like a virus. A virus gets into a cell and changes the, the DNA, changes uh, what the cell is supposed to be doing. And that is why people get sick. That is why people um, have, let's use the dreaded C that hardly anybody really doesn't like to call. That is why cancer happens because cells in the body, they either break down or they multiply uncontrollably. But even in the multiplication of the cells, there is a DNA within the cell that is causing the, um, the functioning of the organ not to function properly. And that is why surgeons then have to go in, if it is possible, to cut away the cells that affect that part or the area or the region in which it is in. If it's beyond help, then they say there's nothing they can do. Or if it is early, they get to it quickly so that they can eradicate. Sometimes they can use red... Um, um, radio waves, <laughs> or they can do certain things to destroy the cell or cells. 
that's causing the damage. That's what we are there to do. We are there to halt sin. Yes, we blow the trumpet, we get people um, ready, or we, like the, let's say the woman and the children, we put them into places, the men within the city will be there to defend. Nowadays, you know, it's men and women. So let us, who are going to fight, nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, the children, we hide the children. That's the future of the city. That's the future of the country. That's the future um, that we're trying to protect. You kill the children, there, there's no future. The trumpet is being blown. We need to protect the valuable things that we have. We need to protect that. And I believe that um, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be um, shouted. It needs to be preached. It needs to be taught. And very and far more important is that we need to live the word. We need to live the word and it is it is important and it is possible it is possible for us to live the world i'm not saying that it is easy it's not easy is anything easy in life <laughs> i dare say i don't think there's anything easy but um I, I i think and i believe that by and with the help of the lord we can overcome yes we can now i'm going to read um joel 18 through the 27. See if I can read that quickly, but but with the understanding. Yes. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face towards the East Sea and his hinder part towards the uttermost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust had eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which i sent unto you and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the lord your god that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed and ye shall know that i am in the midst of israel and that i am the lord your god and none else and my people shall never be ashamed that my my friend is showing great grace great mercy um you know um great great restoration and i and and we cannot say we cannot say that there isn't any prophetic book that we have read so far because we haven't read all of them <laughs> but we cannot say that that God, in as much as he speaks harshly to them before, but he speaks of great blessings that he is going to give to his people. Because if it just stopped at verse 17, or if it, or you know, if we just stopped, you know, a little way up and that was it, 
then obviously the picture that is painted, the picture that is given to us would, would just paint utter devastation and annihilation. And there is, you know, where is the love of God? Where is his goodness? Where is his mercy? But no, God had, does not, did not have that in relation to Israel, to Judah. And I would even go so far as to say in our day and time, God does not have that for us. He doesn't have it for us. He's warning us of the day of, of the Lord. Yes, we are seeing, we are experiencing even our day, even our time across the globe, because it's not only in one country or in one area that we can speak of now. And in various degrees, we are seeing it being played out. But we can see that food very much so is in shortage. In some areas, not as much as in others. The economy is, let's say the bottom is falling out in, in certain areas of our world. People are experiencing loss of jobs, loss of income. People are experiencing loss of homes, of properties, not because of anything of their own doing. It's just that it's happening. Um, governments are failing. Governments are being toppled. And you can add to that list. Just look at what is happening around you. Just be, just, just look, just take note, you know, in various areas of the world, in various areas of your own country, where, wherever you live, we see that there are things happening around us. And we can probably put the similarities to those that happened around Judah or Israel. Devastating. The locusts came, they, they ate everything. Some of us at one point probably were able to give good offerings in church. You were able to pay your tithes, didn't have to think about it. You had one or two credit cards. You could um, use them at any time of the day, of the week, of the month, and pay for them at the end of the month, whenever that period of time came for you. So there was no problem. No problem. You, you would go to the restaurant and eat probably once a week you know you you were able to go on holidays once a year probably twice a year there were things 10 15 20 years back that today you not you can't do it the spending power the of your monies the dollar the pound the yen <coughs> the euro has lost value to the extent Things are much more expensive. So we are experiencing, you know, our worship, we can't do. For, I mean, for instance, I'm just trying to bring similarities here that the people of Judah, of Israel, the loudest stock was dying. They couldn't bring offerings. They couldn't bring a sacrifice. So therefore, the temple, the temple, um, administration such as let's say the feeding of the priests the look the, how the priests live because that's how they lived that was affected so everybody from the top from the administration whether it was political or religious everybody was affected everybody was affected and it is the same thing today everybody's feeling the pinch there are some ministries there's some fellowships there's some churches because of since the pandemic, as they say, or the pandemic, they haven't really been able to operate as they used to. People, um, large organizations, religious organizations are not able to do what they used to do. The tightening of the belt, so to speak, has to be done and is being done. In every area, in every, in every area of our lives, things are happening. But God has a time to bless his people. But all he's asking of us, all he's asking of you, all he's asking of me to do is to examine ourselves, is to examine what we do. Is there any part of what we're doing that should not be there? Are we mixing, are we mixing 
holy with un or the unholy with the holy or the holy with the unholy are we bringing in things into our churches into our fellowships into our um you know into our lives that should not be there that god is saying you don't need that i don't require that it's not a part of what i've asked you to do the lord says here then the lord will be jealous for his land now for me it's unique that he starts with his land first his people are important <laughs> you know um we are important i don't want to lessen that fact i don't want to lessen that at all it's, um we are his people we are the sheep of his pasture he doesn't talk about us like he talks about with, with the animals with the birds and such he doesn't talk about us um and he, he he we are far more valuable than anything else of any part of the creation but it's but it's quite unique in 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 certain of the prophetic books that i have written that i have read sorry that i have read not all of them probably that he starts to have that he's jealous for his land and then he pities his people because the land for israel and judah were very much a part of the promise of the covenant very much a part there was some relationship if the people rejoiced if the people obeyed then the land would reciprocate if the people sinned if the people disobeyed and and rebelled the land would then react to that so it, it's it's quite unique i'm not going to say strange it's quite unique the relationship that god had with the land he speaks about his land about having relationship with the land and then pity his people yet the lord will answer and say unto his people behold i will send you corn so he cares for us he cares for um what we uh, what we have how we're looked after and the time is coming that time is coming he's, he's warning us of the impending danger that is to come that will come but he's also telling us that there is a time after that danger passes that we will be blessed and that we will be blessed all right there there, <clears throat> there are a few things that god's promised us though in his blessings and as he blessed israel and i just want to just bring um, these these points to you don't want to elaborate too much <laughs> if if i can help that um, but the first point i want to bring across is that god is going to restore material prosperity all the farms and vineyards of the nation would be healed and the land would produce enough crops wine and oil to satisfy now i'm not saying that he's he, he he can't do that now but sometimes we focus so much on the materialistic things of this life right now that we that that we are shaded or or the blessings that is to come the blessings that are in store for us we don't see that we think that well it's the here and now and I, I'm, and I'm not saying that he can't do that now. I'm not saying that that he will not give us or give certain individuals. Because whatever he gives us, again, we're, <laughs> we can become so selfish. Because, for instance, let's use myself as an example. The Lord can bless me in such a way that... You know, I'm, I'm, let us say I become the richest man in the UK, but that money is mine. It's, it's for nobody else. But yet what I fail to see and fail to recognize is that the wealth that God has allowed me to, to, to have is not for me. It's, yeah, I, must, I should be a steward to look after and to touch the lives of those that are around as much as I can. 
as much as I can. And I know that there are some very good beneficiaries or some very good philanthropists who do who do, do those things. Well, you know. But again, it's <clears throat> um, I suppose you have to do things properly. I, I suppose you have to be able to apply for, you know, fill out forms. And there are so many people. I sometimes wonder why is it that there's so many people in in Africa, in certain African countries, you know, we raise every year we have particular fundraising events. The world puts these things on. But it never seems as if, you know, the, the people that they portray, the girls, the boys, the babies that they portray on television, it doesn't really seem that it gets there. I don't know. You know, it um it causes me to think, where does all of this money go? Every year there is an increase on the year before, but yet it would seem that no lives. Now I could be wrong. <laughs> I could be totally wrong. Uh, but I don't have the evidence. There's nothing really that is pro that is produced. I mean, probably a lot of it goes on administrations, on buildings, on paying stuff, on the aeroplanes that are taken, and you know, it, the, the food that is dropped or taken. I don't know. I really don't know the expenditures of these organizations around the world. That does good because they do do some good, but it seems that very again more people just seem to be you know really lacking and, and, and needing things but but anyway god promised that he was going to restore he's going to restore um uh, the material things that israel um uh, would have lost because of the dangers that that nation that terrible nation that's going to come from the north and that was the only reason you know even though the um the locusts came and devastated the the, the vegetation and the lives of the people you know it, it it broke let's say the economy but then that was only a picture of what the invaders would do to israel to judah yes <clears throat> um but then after being delivered, after taken out of captivity, God is going to restore Israel. That's what he, this, that, that is what he really is um, he's saying. God is going to restore wealth. Secondly, God would restore respect and honor to his people because of what the invaders would do to his people, make them, and make them outcasts to the nation. Again, Never would they be humiliated, scorned, or ridiculed among the other peoples of the earth. Since this promise has not yet been fully fulfilled, it must refer primarily to the future when the Messiah will establish God's kingdom on earth, the millennium. Yeah, so he's not only speaking of um, times um, of, of um, his historical data as such or, or times of history but he's talking about times of the future the antichrist the beast the dragon he's all out to destroy israel he's all out to destroy abraham's children abraham's seed and when i say abraham's seed i'm talking about the natural jew now i'm not talking about us so to speak because god made a promise um, to Abraham about his seed, even though we're engrafted, but again, I'm talking about Abraham's natural seed. Even before he had a son, he thought that the, that, that the servant that he had, anything happened to him, Abraham, that his servant would receive, but God has bigger ideas. And we know that in the process of time, Isaac came along. And then out of Isaac came Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons multiplied and became a, um, a great nation, and the nation of Israel that we have now, more or less, the political Israel, is very much a part of that. And there were Jews all over the world, really, uh, 
but but the um, the dragon <laughs> the dragon wants to annul God's word. So in order to an in order to annul God's word to bring his to bring God's word um, down to the dust, if he destroys Israel, then he is able now to say God's word is not sure, it's not strong, there's no strength, there's no truth, there's no validity to the word of God. If you can number the heavens or the stars in the heavens, you can number um, your seed. That is what God said to Abraham. So if Abraham, so if they say, if, if, the, if the adversary can destroy um, Israel, if the adversary could destroy Israel, could push Israel into the sea, as, the, as what the Iranians want to do, anyhow they could do that, then our God is not God. And God has already told Abraham, and he has told his seed, that I will protect you, I will be with you. Not only has he told us, the church, that, but he's told the people of Israel, He's told Abraham that. And so his word is not going to return unto him void, but it's going to be accomplished. It's going to be accomplished. So God is going to restore the respect and honor to his people, Israel, and to us, um, the, the, the church. Thirdly, God is going to restore peace and national security. When the Northern army attacked the Jews, the Lord himself would defeat the enemy. Yeah, some of their divisions will be driven into the desert, others into the Eastern Sea, which um, uh, they say is the Dead Sea, and still others into the Mediterranean Sea, which is the Western Sea. And this would be achieved by God himself. There's hardly a battle that Israel has fought where God has not intervened. And it is said in the 1967 war, the Six Day War, I believe it is, that when little, little Israel <laughs> came up against all of the the Arabs in the Middle East, little Israel, you know, just had a few planes, it is said. Um, tanks were far and few between. They never had. They were up against a formidable force. And if you listen at all to, 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 to some of the documentaries, and there was one documentary, they haven't played it again since for a long time that I've heard, that when, when, um, said that, and even um, the father of the president of Rush of um, Syria said that was was the president of Egypt, I believe, at the time, or was it said that? I can't remember if it was um, the one before him, but the Syrian president and the Jordanians and all of all of these Arabs, when they came up against Israel on this particular day. The soldiers, <laughs> when 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 the when the sandstorm had finished, whatever had finished, they saw the Israelis saw empty tanks. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. Um, they had the missiles to to destroy the tanks. You know, they saw empty tanks. They saw uh, military machines or whatever on in the deserts the Arabs had run off and left them because of what they saw. Now, it is not, it hasn't been explained what it is they saw. It hasn't been explained. They just saw something on the side of the Israeli army that they had never seen before and they were afraid. You see, the, God is not going to allow Israel to be destroyed. Israel may face a formidable foe. Israel may battle. They may lose soldiers and lose heavily, but God is not going to allow Israel to be destroyed. The world must know that God is God. 
and he's there to defend. You see, he's not only there to defend the people, but he's there to defend his land. I think, we, I think, I really believe, and this is just my thoughts. I mean, I really believe that his land, the land that they're on there right now, they didn't, it, they never have to fight for it to some extent. It was given to them way back, given to their, um, to their father, Abraham. God said, what you see, where your feet touch, that is the land I'm giving you. And the land of Israel that is there, that political land, I, I believe that's what it's termed on, on maps, the size of Israel as it is there now, that's not that's not the size of it, of, um, of Israel. Israel is far larger. And it is has even been proven in the scriptures that whatever wherever Israel went and fought their enemies, they took that land. And they possessed that land for some reasons or the other. They 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 would lose. They would lose, um, you know, the the gains that that they have and 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 that they held on to. But I believe that the land in which political Israel today has is not the size that God's land is. And God is going to God is going to take His land back. I won't even say that it is Israel's gonna take, but God. The enemy knows that. And when I say the enemy, I'm, I'm not talking all well. It, it, it could be the Syrians and the Jordanians and the, the Iranians and such, and the Egyptians, they, they may know because there's a lot of things in antiquity that is known but the masses don't know and i'm including myself there's something that we that i just do not know because it's been withheld but i believe that that israel is far greater in land mass than what we are told and what we have been shown and god is coming back to establish himself and to establish the people in the land which he has which he had given and promised to them fourthly god is going to restore the land itself <clears throat> the promised land of god um, the lord instructed the land not to fear <laughs> God instructed the land not to fear. Although some protesters, or sorry, although some interpreters apply this, this um, exhortation to the land, of, to the people of the land, most likely it is a poetic way of describing the restoration of the land's fertility, production, peace, security, freedom from war, and destruction. Verse 21, it says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Can you imagine? The Creator is speaking to the earth. <clears throat> now, there are many experts who have said that the earth is alive. It's a living organism. And I would, I would partly agree. I think I would agree with that. The earth is not dead. You know, what we walk up and down on and and drive on um, and do a lot of things on. It's not there. It's, it's God's. God made the earth. It is a. It is. God, man, and the earth were in sync at one point. There was harmony between the earth and man with Adam. We know that. I believe that we we could all agree with that. Somewhere along the uh, along the way. Man disobeyed, disobeyed God, rebelled, um, did what he did, and God had to excommunicate him out of the garden. And and in in the pushing out, he cursed man. You know, he put a curse on man, and he put a curse on the woman. By the sweat of your brow, we we're gonna eat. And in, in pain, in labor, will would will, 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 um, Eve um, have her children? So the earth, 
the living earth and man you know lost that harmony lost that relationship even though we still and there are many men today yeah we got farmers they've studied the land geologists and all the other just that we that relate to to um, to the land they understand how the land works yes i believe that but there was a harmony i believe at one point that was far greater and far more tangible than what we realize right now but god speaks to the land the creator <laughs> and he's telling the land do not fear what a god what a god and he tells the land don't fear you know i'm here paul that's why i think paul i don't think there's any connection here but it comes to mind paul says that creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of god the earth has much more strength than what we would ever realize or could ever led to believe because at that time we're really going to see the strength of the earth we're really going to see the manifestation of the earth at some point in the future i believe that evidence for this interpretation is the fact that god encourages the wild animals not to fear any longer the land would now produce more than enough fruit for them destroyers of the land such as locusts and invading armies would no longer be a threat to the wild animals so he speaks not only to the land but he speaks to the very animals telling them not to fear be not be afraid ye beasts of the field for the pastures of the wilderness do spring you see not only is there a theological picture or a prophetic utterance being given in as much as what's happening what's going to happen in the future but here because of what happened really happened with the devastation that the locusts did and everything like that giving a picture again of what the the invading forces would bring and what what devastation they would bring to the people of god god again is bringing to his people and showing us that he's going to speak to the very elements, speak to the very surroundings where his people are. He's going to calm, calm the, the, the spirit of the land and calm the spirits of the wild animals saying, don't fear, I will feed you. I'm going to look after you. I am creator. I am God. And he's saying to us as his people, listen, you don't have to fear either. I will look after you. I will care for you. The corn, the wine, all of these things are going to going to are going to come lord how great is our god eh? god would um fifth god would restore god would restore good weather there would no longer be famine there would be no longer be drought an abundance of rain an abundance of rain both the spring and the fall would, would fall from the sky to water the earth. God cares for us, you know. He cares for us. And even in this time, even this time of, of scarcity for many of us, and, and you may be feeling, um, feeling you know, um, having struggles right now i don't know but if we put our trust in the lord the lord is going to bless us the lord is going to keep us he's going to allow the goodness of god to be seen in our lives yes he is he, he's not going to let us be humiliated i don't believe that i don't believe that the enemy is not going to laugh at us the psalmist says and say ah ah where is their god no no god I believe is he is encouraging us he is encouraging you he's bringing you he's bringing us into this into a desired and never again would the people go hungry 24 25 says and the floor shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil 
and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar. It was a prophetic utterance that he was promising his people because they they knew what scarcity was they knew what hunger and thirst was literal this is not a spiritual utterance here by saying spiritual well they were spiritually destitute yeah they were and their spirituality was then manifested um into a natural thing into a natural disorder because because of their disobedience and their rebellion against god god then had to chastise them and he was using things nature and he was using the external things to to bring them back into a desired relationship that he wanted but he also said that i'm going to bless you i'm going to care for you i'm going to love you in ways that you will know that i am your god the sixth and the last area here is that God would restore the people's supplies. All storage facilities, distribution centers will be filled with food. <laughs> the years of production lost due to in the invasion of the locusts won, but the Northern army would be repaid in full Never again would the people go hungry. They would always have plenty of food to eat. And again, this shows, this give the, gives a picture of, of, um, of the, what can I say now, the, the, the millennium or the time when God is going to, is, is going to establish his government, his kingdom on earth, and he's going to reign and he's going to rule and with the destruction of the enemy, with the destruction of the opposing forces that oppose him, we're going to never run out of food again. There will be plenty now because we're going to have new bodies. I don't know if we will need food. Probably not, probably so. I don't know, I can't say. But whatever it is that we're going to have, it will never, there will never be a lack. There will never be a point in time when we will have to worry about the enemy coming in amongst us and destroying us. We will have to worry about that because he will be in the midst. Amen. He will be in the midst. We will never be ashamed. Verse 27 says, And he shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never, never be ashamed. That's great encouragement. When we are encouraged about something in the future, we work towards that future. If somebody said to you, listen, you work and I'm going to make you manager. Or I'm going to make you a director. If you continue, I'm going to, you know, give you a new car. I'm going to buy you a home. I'm going to do this. You work. There's something of an encouragement that you work towards, isn't it? Same thing here. The Lord says that he's in the midst of us and we'll never be ashamed. Why? Because he's going to supply all of our needs now and in the future, not past. If he's saying he's going to supply your needs, but then he's referring to history, historic data, then that's no encouragement. What kind of encouragement is that? Tell me. If if the Lord says he's going to fight your enemies, he's going to destroy your, you know, the opposing forces, he's going to pull down strongholds and all of that, and he's going to allow you to live where milk and honey flow so to speak and there's riches laid up for you but it's all historically then that's no encouragement that doesn't encourage you how does that encourage you it doesn't but when it's but when he's telling you when you're being informed of what is to come of what will happen then we've got something to look forward to and even in our day and time today, right now, 
He's promised to look after us. He's promised to supply our needs. He's promised not only for the future, but he's promised right now. And many of you have evidences of God's hand of provision. Many of you have evidences of God's healing hand. Many of you have evidence that many do not have. But with the testimony that you have, and that's why you must share your testimonies. That's why we must share our testimonies. Because with the testimony of the one or the two, of the father, of the mother, you know, that is before us or with us, we then know that our God cares for us and that if he's done it for one, he will do it for all. He's not partial. Whether you're tall or short, whether you're big or you're small like me, you know, whether you're black or white, God is not dependent. He doesn't work on what color you are. And sometimes, sometimes we have that swimming around in our Pentecostal churches or evangelical churches or in our independent churches that because we are probably of one color or four or of one cultural ethnicity or, you know, of, um, from a, um, an area or one area of, 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 of society. We believe that God favors some or God loves some more than the other. No, he doesn't. It's th that is not it. God loves us all the same way. It is the plan of the enemy to divide us. It is the plan of the enemy to cut us up and to, and to cause us to say the things that we say and to feel the way that we feel. He's doing his work very well when, when we come out with these things. But our God, our God, your God, my God, <laughs> he supplies all of our needs. And he has promised, he said, that he will be in the midst of his people. And my people shall never be ashamed. May God bless you. May God bless you. May you be encouraged. May you be encouraged. You know, um, I believe that that we're going to be seeing some very troubling things in our day and time. One such troubling thing is what really um, troubled, I think, the world. <laughs> Whatever happened in Russia a few days ago, I think it troubled Washington very much so. I think that um, they 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 were wondering if um, if Mr. Putin was going to be toppled. But you know what? Again, sometimes we are told one thing, but sometimes there is something else going on. We are told that they didn't know what was going on, or they were not a part of what was going on. And we have to believe we don't have the evidence or anything else other than what they say. But the thing about it again is with all the intelligences, and if they can have um, a satellite in space to look down and see what you're eating in your house at times or drinking without them ever thinking that you don't know that they're there, then don't you think that they know more than what they're letting on when they say that, that um, when they say certain things on the televisions or in the news, <laughs> in the news, um, um, uh, you know, all of these things. Where is the man of God right now? Where is the prophet right now that can speak to our leaders and can speak to this world, speak to our world leaders? Where are they? Where is he? Where is she? Where is the Elijahs or the Elishas of our world? Where are they? That's my question. That's, that's just a question. I'm, I'm not taunting anybody. You know, um, there must be one that is that is able to trouble. Let me use the word trouble Israel. There's got to be one that is troubling um, our, our world leaders at this time. Because they cannot just be let loose and think that they're in charge and that there isn't anything else out there we use and they use god loosely they 
you know, they quote the Bible loosely and probably just to appease um, the, the, the leaders of, um, of Christianity. But I just want to say to, and just leave out there that we mustn't trifle with God. We mustn't, we mustn't play with him. We can't taunt him and we can't appease him. I believe that we've got to be very serious. Um, we've got to be very serious. And, and my, my appeal, I'm, I'm appealing to those who has the influence and the authority and the power. I'm appealing to all of my colleagues. I'm just touching just a very small percentage of people's and ears that many others are touching, but many others are touching much more and they're listening to you. They're following you, they're hearing you. And I'm just asking you really just to, um, to send a warning, also encouragement to our leaders, political as well as um, leaders of finance and the industry that there is a God that needs to be heard and that he's speaking. He's never stopped speaking. He has never stopped calling out and reaching out to man. And it is our chance now. We have this opportunity. You have this opportunity right now to reach others and to hear what God is saying, saying constantly. And um, I think that we just need to be, we just need to be obedient anyway. You all know that already. <laughs> so so it's sometimes it's pointless saying the things that others already know. What is it that I know that you don't? That's what you really want to know, isn't it? Because everything I've said, you know. But the thing, the, the sad thing about it is that we fail to follow and to hear and to be obedient to the voice of God. We fail to do that, just as Israel did. We fail. And we are failing miserably. Thank you, dear God. Thank you for your mercies towards us. Thank you for your word, the word of God that was given to Joel, to the people of Israel, Judah. Thank you, Lord, for the mercies in which you gave to them and showed to them. But you also showed to us great mercy and grace. And there is great restoration that is to take place. It is coming. It is soon at hand. And I pray, my God, that we will be ready to be a part of that. We will, my God, uh, give ourselves to you. We will humbly submit ourselves to you. We will walk uprightly, Lord, according to your word. Even though, Lord, you used the, the, the very low cost to send a picture of the, of the invasion of the armies of the north that was to come upon your people to chastise them, but it wasn't to destroy them. But Lord, you also sent a message of restoration and of mercy, saying to them that that is what you had in store for them. And the very land also, who, whom you also, Lord, had a relationship with. Dear God, it is all because you are the creator. You are God. There's no other God that has that unique relationship with creation, for they are not gods. Hallelujah, Lord, we thank you. And we pray that this day, this day, this time, Lord, we will commit ourselves to you. We will call upon your name. And we will not only just call and be called by your name, but we will have a relationship with you. And we will humbly submit ourselves to you. And we will be obedient, Lord, to the word the expressed word of God. Thank you again. Those who are not well in body, I pray that you'll touch them. Those who are not well in mind, in soul, I pray that you'll also touch them. There are so many, Lord, who are not well, but they look well. There are so many, my God, who are not well in mind, soul or spirit, but yet, Lord, they are, they are being, my God, they're being looked after 
dear God, by the consultants and by the doctors that can give them or that, that can address the things that they think that they can. But I pray, my God, that you will go in beyond where man can go and that you will touch and heal the hearts and souls of many. Lord, we're looking to you. We're trusting in you. We're believing in you. And I pray, my God, that at that time, at the proper time, at the time designated in, in the future, that, my God, we will all stand before the Lord and we will all hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. Thank you again. We leave everything to you and we on your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much for connecting with us. And I pray that you will continue to do so. Pray for us. That is the seed I'm asking you to sow for me. Prayer. Prayer for my parents. Prayer for my family. For the family of my, of my sister. Pray for our church. Pray for your church. Pray for the leaders. If there's ever a time that we need to pray for our leaders, our overseers, our presbyters, our pastors, it is today, knowing that the wisdom of God is needed. The wisdom of God is needed. And we can only get that wisdom if we submit ourselves to him, God. Then he will then see that we um, are, are at the place where he can instill in us the wisdom, the understanding, and the knowledge of the holy. That we may, able to, may be able to give some direction in which... Um, our society, our community, our church, our families ought to go. So may God bless you and may his face shine upon you and give you that inner peace that the world cannot give. God bless you. See you again tomorrow if the Lord so desires. God bless you.